Good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. I am your speaking time. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I needed to take a breath there for a second. Okay, so um, this morning we are going to talk about a Sunday morning posture check. So my mom and I were looking through some pictures the other day, and we were joking that there was no mistaking that my stepfather was a police officer. The way he carried himself, his posture, his stance, made it all very clear that he was law enforcement. One of my stepbrothers followed in his footsteps, and he's become a detective. And like his father, there's no mistaking that he is law enforcement. It got me thinking as we've been studying about the marks of the disciple on Wednesday nights. This study covers six different measurements for growth as a follower of Christ. And the first week we learned about repentance and how we need to have a posture or a lifestyle of repentance as his children. This really resonated with me and I found myself coming across the words posture and lifestyle in my devotions and in my readings. And in fact, one thing I read became my title for this morning. A pastor in the US said this, you can pray before meals, but be a jerk to the wait staff. You can read the Bible every morning, but go to work and exploit people. You can evangelize on street corners, but ignore the unhoused folks who are around you. Without a Christ-like posture, our Christian practices don't matter. That really made me think, so what does a Christ-like posture look like, and do I reflect that? So please do not think that I'm standing up here proclaiming that I do all of this well, or that I always do as I should. If anything, preparing to speak this morning has reminded me that I am so flawed and fall short of the mark, but that also makes me all the more thankful for the grace that God extends to me and his forgiveness. So let's talk about posture, but first, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house today, to learn more about you, to dig into your word. And Lord, I just pray that as you give me the words to speak, Lord, that you would be working in hearts, that you, Lord, would change each and every one of us to be more like you, so that our posture, our lifestyle, represents and shows people you, because that is what you've called us to do. So Lord, give us ears that hear and help us to walk this out as we live our lives for you. In your name we pray, amen. So our posture is how we hold our various body parts, our head, our neck, our spine, our shoulders, our hips, and our feet. I kind of feel like I should leave head and shoulders, knees and toes, but we won't do that. So all of this, produces a stance, and a stance sends a message. It could be one of confidence, it can be one of defiance or insecurity, it can be one that shows that I'm bored or I'm uncomfortable. Medical professionals all agree that good posture is comprised of a number of different things. Out of posture, how we sit, when we stand, when we lie down, when we bend, and when we move in general. We have to be mindful of how we move in all of these different ways to maintain good posture. Has anybody's mother ever said to them, sit up straight? Yeah, don't slouch. Yeah, hold your head up, right? We all hear that. So it reminded me of verses four to nine in Deuteronomy six that's often read at baby dedications. Is that me? Okay, we're good, okay. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words that I command you today, they shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be like frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. God commands 
God's command is it to be on their hearts, on their hand, between their eyes, spoken about as they walk, as they sit, as they lie, and as they rise. They're to see it as they walk in and out of their homes. So what's left? Nothing. In other words, their stance or their posture was to reflect their love for God. And how do we do this? I'm the girl, I like the practical that accompanies a teaching. So one, a Christ-like posture demonstrates our relationship with him. It starts here. We should have a relationship with Christ. Not just, I know about him. I know lots about the queen. I can give you lots of details and facts about the queen, but I didn't know her personally. How do we get to know someone who becomes important to us? Think of your spouse, your best friend, your neighbor, your coworker. We begin a dialogue and we learn things about them that, and we realize that there are characteristics or traits that we are drawn to. As we're introduced to God, we may find as we attend church or a Bible study or something like the Y program here, we investigate and learn more about him. We have our Bibles to learn about God, his character, his faithfulness, his heart for sinners like you and me, and the forgiveness and the gift of eternal life that he offers to us that we can receive when we repent, ask for forgiveness, and invite him into our hearts as Lord and Savior. When I met my husband and realized that there was so much about him that I liked and grew to love, I didn't stop talking to him. So you can pray for him because 27 years later, I'm still talking to him. <laughs> we continue that dialogue to this day. Relationships die without communication and our relationship with God is no different. We need to keep talking to him through our prayer life and we need to keep learning about him and be attentive to how it is that he's speaking to us. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 that we are to pray without ceasing. In the marks of the disciple study we're doing now, Pastor Dean and Sarah, he refers to this posture as a continual practice of turning away from the things of this earth and turning to the things of God and his heart. As we continue in our walk, more of our behavior, our attitudes, and our choices get revealed to us, and it can become very obvious when we're paying attention that sometimes those things are not in alignment with God's heart. Hi. Thanks. Okay. All right, we're searching gears here. Everybody okay? Okay. So there's a refinement at work, and the prophet Malachi compared God's work to us by his transformative power as the refiner's fire in chapter 3, part of verse 2. That is eliminating the impurities and making something beautiful. We know that the scripture is an imperative part of this, as we learn from Paul, as he writes in Timothy to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He's addressing the godlessness in the last days and how people will be lovers of self, money. They will be proud. They will be arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, and not loving good, but they will be lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God. I'm not even including everything that Paul lists here. And in verse 5, Paul says very plainly, avoid these people. Sound familiar? All of the things of this world. But I want to turn to the things of God so that the encouragement that Paul offers in Timothy verses 14 to 17 is a reminder that it applies to us. Paul says, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from who you've learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Take note here that Paul references the sacred writings and scripture. We have more at our fingertips in terms of devotions, articles, and resources to comment and conjecture about God's word. 
but we have to make sure that we are using the Bible and God's truth as our baseline and compare everything else to that to make sure that we are learning the truth, not someone else's version of the truth. Once we have an active relationship with God, we move on to the next posture. So number two, a Christ-like posture demonstrates our surrender and our dependence on him. When we say that Christ is Lord of my life, it means that we are surrendering our all to him and his sovereign plan for our lives. Our time, our resources, our bodies, our money, none of these are our own. All of these are on loan to us and we're to use each one to glorify God and to draw others to him. As we surrender and remember, we're turning away from the things of this world It's going to come at a cost to us. There's sacrifice, and it is a very deliberate choice to follow God, to follow that prompting. It's very easy to choose the things that appeal to us on an earthly level. And how do we do that? Maybe you get promoted at work, or you end up with a really big tax refund. And so what are you going to do with those funds? Are you maybe going to upgrade your car to a nicer one? Are you maybe going to buy yourself something nice for your house? Or are you going to bump up what you give at the next World Missions Sunday? Maybe you're going to use that money and you are going to help a youth go on retreat so that they can be fed. It's not just a one-time thing. When you go grocery shopping, are you being intentional about adding extra pantry items to your grocery basket so that you can help fill the supply pantry for the Bread of Life ministry. When you have some time and you're deciding what to do, are you dedicating it to the Helping Hands ministry or are you deciding to do something that isn't going to help you in your relationship with God? It's our time, our resources, our talents, and our choices that we need to use to demonstrate our surrender and sacrifice to follow Christ. We have had the perfect model of sacrifice and surrender in Jesus Christ and his willingness and obedience to go to the cross to bear our punishment for our sin. Philippians 2, 3 to 8 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. This is completely contrary to what the world tells us today. Look on your device, look at any advertisement, read anything. This is completely contrary to what we are learning. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. After the Last Supper with the disciples, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and told the disciples to pray. He moved away from them and he knelt down to pray and he said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We find that in Luke 22, 42. And Jesus is praying to God that he would be spared while also surrendering to God's will. According to Luke in chapter 22, verses 43 and 44, his his despair was so profound that his sweat became like great drops of blood. And he was comforted by an angel. I can't imagine being so distressed that my sweat would become like blood. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what was God's will. For him to die, and not just die, but to be crucified, considered the most painful and the longest way to die at the time. We sang about it. We'll never know how much it costs to see you hang upon that cross. We sang that over and over and over this morning. That's sacrifice for us. So here's the sacrifice and the surrender, but also his dependence on God, because he's comforted by an angel. We're not always going to have an angel appear. But God's comfort and peace is found when we need it, when we surrender and we ask him to be present with us. Our dependence on God comes when we know and acknowledge that everything we have, 
our breath, our day, our family, our health, our job, our clothing, our provision, food, everything comes from him. And we're called to be good stewards of what he's entrusted to us. When we work, we're to do it remembering who our true authority is, the Lord. Colossians 3, 23 to 24 tells us, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. My earthly boss is Pastor Don. So when he says, you are speaking, I have to be obedient. (laughs) He's a gentleman though, he asks. But it's one of those questions where you know it's probably not a good idea to say no, right? So I report to him, I'm accountable to him, and I take my direction from him. But ultimately, I am doing everything under the authority of Jesus. And once we realize that we're to have this posture of relationship, surrender and dependence, I come to understand that I have so much to thank God for, and I love him all the more, and my appreciation for him grows. So three, a Christ-like posture demonstrates my thankfulness, and out of that, love grows. When I'm quiet, which isn't often, and I reflect on what I have with God and what I have because of God, I cannot be anything but incredibly humbled and overwhelmed by his goodness to me. I'm forgiven. I am free from the punishment that my sin deserves. I'm bathed in his grace and patience as I grow in my walk, in my understanding of his heart for me and for everyone else. I don't get treated as I should, and I am given grace that is unmerited and unearned by anything that I can do. But it is all because of what Jesus has done for me. I am a new creation. We're going to look at Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17. And as I read, please see yourself as God sees you, chosen, holy, beloved, and so much to be thankful for. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you have been called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word and in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We're commanded to forgive as we have been forgiven. That can be a hard one, can't it? We want to hold on to what's been done to us, and we feel like we're justified in our desire to not extend forgiveness is really quite reasonable. But as we pray for God to change our hearts, we hope to realize that what I am being asked to forgive someone for is nothing in comparison to what Christ has forgiven me. So we pray, help me see this person in front of me as you see them, God. And I realize that God can change my heart and he can soften and I can forgive and I can even come to love that person. Remember the first and second commands we are given in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. So we've talked about a Christ-like posture and how it should demonstrate my relationship with him, my surrender and my dependence on him, my thankfulness to him, and out of this, my love for him and others should grow. And this brings us to the last posture we're going to look at this morning. A Christ-like posture demonstrates an eternal perspective, not an earthly one. 
there's so much that can be said about how we're to walk this out. We go back to our authority and our source of truth, his word. Let's look at Colossians 3, 1 to 2. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. Our assignment on earth, each one of us is called to be a reflection of God's love, his grace, his forgiveness, and to tell others all of this because there are so many in the world who do not know him. They too can have a life-changing relationship with him. Our job is to tell them. But this requires an investment on our part to tell others. We depend on God to give us the words and the discernment to know what to say and how to say it and when to say it. We pray that our choices, our actions, our priorities, and our behaviors are a testimony to him. But the results of all of these postures rest with him, not with us. But we must remember our instruction from Jesus that he gave first to the 11 disciples who went to Galilee as he instructed them after his resurrection. Jesus said to them in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have the responsibility to share this gift that we've been given in knowing Christ and being redeemed. He's with us as we build relationships with others, as we make daily choices, both big and seemingly small ones, that demonstrate our surrender and our dependence on him, that show we're thankful to him and we love like him. So church, this is the challenge to all of us. Let's demonstrate a Christ-like posture to the world that helps to draw people to him. Let's show our families, our friends, our coworkers, our fellow students, our neighbors, and others that what this world offers, its priorities, its definition of truth and security are not what Christ offers us. But what Christ gives us and what we have with him and in him are eternal, secure, abundant, and more than we will ever need or ever imagine.